again, we're just letting everybody in. Um, so we will start the discussion properly in literally just a minute. So just please be patient. You have a little bit of time to go and get your coffee or tea, depending on where you are. And we will start in a minute. Okay, we already have more than 100 uh, people and it seems the numbers keep rising, but it's already two minutes past the time we're supposed to start. So we're gonna go ahead. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. Welcome to the Land Dialogue webinar series. It is being organized in partnership with the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Thin. I'm a journalist specializing in food systems and climate change issues, and I'm delighted to be I'm delighted to be moderating today's session. Now, this is the first land dialogue discussion for this year, and we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. What this means is that instead of having a 90-minute session, we are going to have a 60-minute webinar. Now, don't worry. There is time set aside still for Q&A, and we're also going to be keeping a lookout for interesting questions that's going to, that I'm sure will come up during the discussion, and we'll see if we can fit them in even before the Q&A starts. Now, the idea behind this whole webinar series is to raise awareness on the land rights of Indigenous peoples and local communities. This is because these rights are a prerequisite to achieve national and international goals around many, many things. And those include forest governance, food security, climate mitigation, economic development, and human rights. Now, there will be four land dialogues in total this year, and each one will be focusing on a different topic. Now, before I get into today's discussion topic, I would like to just go through a few housekeeping rules. First, this webinar is in English, but we have simultaneous translations in French, Spanish, um, Portuguese, and Bahasa Indonesia. To access your translation, all you have to do is to go to this little um, globe icon that you can see at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now you can click on it and then select the language that you want. Like I said earlier, the webinar will last 60 minutes. We have about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. However, please use the chat box to let us know where, who you are, which organization you belong to, and where you're joining us from. Also, please feel free to tweet using the dialogue, the hashtag LEN Dialogues. That's just one word, hashtag LEN Dialogues. And you can also follow the live tweets from LEN Portal and Tenure Facility Twitter accounts. Finally, we're also recording today's session and we will share the link with all of you later. Now that we've gotten all of that out of the way, let's turn to today's topic. And that is taking data back women's sovereignty over land data. Now, we so often hear these days about how important data is, right? That data is the new oil. So we want to better understand where the current model of data science is and whether it includes and reflects the realities of indigenous women and their land rights. We want to know whether they are able to participate in data collection and use particularly when that data is about them and their land tenure. And if they can't participate, we want to know why and how this can be remedied, how they can take back control. 
Now, it's important that we define a couple of key terms before starting this discussion, because you're going to be hearing these terms throughout today's conversation. And the first term is Indigenous Data Sovereignty, or IDS for short. And this refers to the right of Indigenous peoples to control data from and about their communities and lands, articulating both individual and collective rights to data access and to privacy. The second term is called data feminism. Now, this is a framework for thinking about data science and ethics that is guided by ideas of intersectional feminism. The work of data feminism uncovers how standard practices in data science, how they serve to reinforce existing inequalities around the world. We're going to be sharing some of the links about these terms in the chat box, so keep your chat box open. Now I'm going to introduce you to our speakers who are going to help us understand the whole debate around data uh, better. In the interest of fairness, I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order. Now, first we have Betty Rubio, who is a Quechua leader. Unfortunately, Betty is in the field at the moment and we haven't been able to reach her, so she might not be able to join us today. However, we do have Danique Puriati, who is director of Vishnu Foundation in Indonesia. Now, Danique has been involved in grassroots activities for over 25 years, and she's an expert when it comes to organizing local communities, village planning, customary village empowerment, and community-based ecotourism. We then have Lydia Jennings, who is a Native American soil microbiologist and an environmental scientist. Lydia's conducted research on soil health, environmental remediation, indigenous science, and environmental data ownership by tribal nations. Lydia is currently a presidential postdoctoral fellow at the School of Sustainability and the Nicholas School of the Environment. And last but definitely not the least is Rudo Kemper, who is Chief Program Officer at the Cadesta Foundation. Rudo is a geographer and a technologist, and he has over a decade of experience supporting indigenous communities in mapping and monitoring their lands, and also to build digital tools that increase community self-determination, access to land rights, and land management capabilities. Now, I've already talked far too much, so I'm going to turn to the experts and then ask them a couple of rounds of questions. And I really encourage them to respond to each other's answers and to build on them. My only request is to keep your answers to maximum two to three minutes. Now, again, to the audience, please use the Q&A box to send your questions. And it would be great if you could also identify yourself and your organization. Now, Danik, can I turn to you first? Um, I would like you to sort of help us set the scene in terms of what is happening right now, you know, when it comes to data, because you have extensive experience working with local indigenous communities. Can you tell us, you know, who is collecting this data, who has access, who doesn't, and what are some of the main problems? Danik, can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry, my internet is a uh, trouble. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a bit of my internet connection, so I really apologize for that. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sudah, sudah. Tadi saya internet saya putus. Maaf. Uh, tadi saya tidak bisa diulangi, Mbak Intan. If you don't mind repeating the question, then I'm sorry. I'm having a bit of an internet problem. No problem. I was just asking Danik to sort of help set the scene, you know, in terms uh, of what's happening right now when it comes to data collection. Who's doing it? Mm -hmm. You know, who has access and who doesn't? What what is the what are some of the problems that indigenous women in particular are facing right now when it comes to data? Uh, 
Baik, uh, terima kasih. Mohon maaf, saya tidak menyalakan video. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really sorry. I don't think I'll turn off my video camera. I hope I have I will have better connection. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the moment. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ten and everyone else. So you inquire of data. You asked me to, you know, start the scene here in Indonesia and at least and in Bali. Um, majority of data collection work is still being done by the government. So most land data would would uh, be collected would and then be stored by the government. So you inquire about women. What, does women have access to it? It is very much contingent on the well the ability of the women themselves to to do so and the thing about it is that uh, land ownership in bali it's not just about the economic or the land value but it's very much integral to cultural aspect and this is something that i think can be very problematic because there's an issue of individual certification on lands uh, located in bali and this is causing issues such as limited access to women and women as you know women and then indigenous group and yeah there's very restricted access because of um there's there's a priority over investment rather than uh women's uh land tenure maybe that's all for now thank you no, that's 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 really helpful to give the very specific example from Bali. Rudo, can I bring you in because you've worked with a lot of indigenous groups? What are some of the problems you are currently seeing right now? What are some of the issues? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so thanks, Ben, and hi everyone. It's really great to be here with you today. Yeah. So thinking about this question of setting the stage, I think of a lot of my experience working with indigenous communities, especially in the Amazon region in South America. Uh, where the villages are very remote and the community members have had limited access to technology. And I definitely, you know, um, what Denik said around it, most of the initiatives have been government led until very recently. I see that happening in the Amazon as well. But one of the more interesting recent trends is that you do start to see um, a lot of community driven data collection processes taking place because community members have found the need to collect their own data or make their own maps to be able to counter the maps that either the government has or that outside interests like extractive industries, you know, have, which shows a lot of data like concessions over the land, but it doesn't show any of the indigenous knowledge or any of the community's perspective on what their land looks like. So community members are starting to do more data collection. And some of that is also due to the increasing availability of, you know, easy to use uh, smartphone applications for data collection and mapping. And that's really good, but there is kind of a disconnect and an incompleteness about the data cycle that I've seen. Um, that I think a lot more work needs to be done on because you have community members, including women, that are involved in data collection, but then there's a gap once that data has been collected and has to be submitted somewhere to be processed. And that's where I start to see that a lot of the communities have less and less control or autonomy over that process because it has to be sent somewhere. Um, the internet, for example, in which case if a community is remote or offline, they don't have access to that data or there's a latency, they don't have access to it for months. Um, frequently an outside party like an NGO or a researcher or sometimes even the government has to get involved in helping process some of that data or analyze it. And so you start to see less and less control by the community over the data once it has been collected. So in terms of the data cycle, there's still a lot of incompleteness and gaps. And I think also in terms of indigenous women, you know, their level of access to that data gets to be diminished as well as more dominant interests within the community might be the only parties that are receiving that data once it has been processed or collected as well. So I, th I think there's some promising trends in terms of the increasing availability of access to data collection tools, but there's still a lot of gaps. Maybe I'll start with that. Thanks, Ruder. Um, Lydia, I saw you nodding. Uh, when both Danik and Ruda were talking. And I just just want to give you, before I oh, go back again to Danik, if you wanted to add anything. Oh, you're still on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think um, both have made really important points. I also just want to make sure that we are more expansive on what we consider as data. And so I think when we talk about data science and a lot of these conversations about land data, we tend to think through this very colonial lens of these binary numbers that are collected um, and really making sure that we step back and are reflective that 
data is inclusive of our languages, of our locations of sacred ecosystems, of our relationships to our human and non-human kin. Um, and that's a really important piece that uh, in women, indigenous women have always held in different capacities and are typically part of the dominant narrative of data. And so as we talk about today in this conversation of women being um, knowledge and data experts, it's really important to recognize that in different cultures, um, and I think of my own, you know, the type of knowledge and data that women are experts in might be different than the men. And it's not because of um, gender disparities, it's because we recognize that we each have different roles as knowledge keepers and knowledge experts. And so really making sure that we are expansive as we talk about these pieces in this conversation today. Great, thank you, Lydia. Danik, I want to come to you, and that sort of links to what you talked earlier about, you know, Indigenous women and the cultural values, and also, you know, sort of linked to what Lydia just, just talked about, how we see data as well. You know, how, when we, you know, you talked about the challenges, you know, in Bali, in Indonesia in particular, your experience, how could you know this collection of land related data could be done in a way that reflects cultural values right because i think you talked about and i think lydia also talked about just now as women as the center of you know data and these values um danae can you yeah how, how how can this be how can data can be collected in a way that reflects cultural values for indigenous women Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, at least I'm going to speak uh, from Bali. But before I go further, with regard to uh, land data, especially land data in Bali, because, well, we have to understand the connection, the, the relationship between Balinese and their lands. We have the conviction. We have a local belief. And we believe and we subscribe to the five elements that is, you know, that is underpinning the creation of the world as a whole. And we share the same elements with the nature, with earth. And so it is within our obligation to be the guardian of the land, the earth, everything that, uh, that is available to us here. So with regard to, with regard to the recent development, you know, in the past we have, we've had our religious we have we had our religious leaders, our uh, our figures who have governed, who have set up the whole uh, land management. We have the administration system. We have spatial planning, residential area, what's good for public place. Everything we have, we have that management. But then there was this was in the past. But then after independence, and then when government of Indonesia acting on behalf of growth or economic development and then starting to when then when investment starts to take precedence uh, sooner than later the cultural values start to diminish and it creates uh, it creates chaos in bali so most bali balinese who have what we call a prasasti and then we have local Beliefs, we can we can no longer uh, talk with the government because the government refused to acknowledge the significance of that sort our belief system that it and they call it invalid and they call it, and then they they uh, they introduce land certification and then with the whole basic agrarian law that's causing massive disputes and yeah even more problems. So when there's a shift in the policy that I guess started back in the reform era, we started to in, we started to introduce participatory mapping. I guess this is similar to what Rud, Rudo mentioned earlier. We start to engage the community to be to be part of participatory mapping to and to do that more actively. And yeah, it's more a, it's a self uh, their individual, their independent exercise. And so from Wisnu Foundation, we started working with the community groups, the community organization to educate them about, uh, you know, land and the whole uh, spatial, have more spatial awareness. And we mobilize them, we work with them more closely. We work with the 
village uh, Com, com, village apparatus, the village community organization. We work with the youth. We work with many local groups. We start to educate them, make them more aware about what they have and their ability. And then we start to build a, an agreement with the village government as well about the steps that they have to that they have to do. And since we're encountering the the reality of globalization. And I'm sure you know, I'm sure everybody knows about investment in Bali and how that is, it is penetrating our daily lives. It is, you know, uh, entering into uh, indigenous lands. And we we think it's a tad too late. It is, a, it's very, so the huge flow of tourism and that's making, I guess making the local Balinese had, forgotten about our local values, about the whole five elements. We want to remind them again about the uh, the local values that we that we have, that we should have upheld. And so we want to we want to make we want to remind them again about these values. And so we started to do, as I mentioned, participatory plan, participa participatory mapping with women and youth, the 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 male youth. And that is, I guess it's easier to work with them. They can work with, and if we can, and we also encourage the women to do not uh, not only land data, but also social data. So in, in this exercise, we also allow facilitate transfer of knowledge. We want to have a transfer of knowledge between, you know, the elders to the youth, but that is very fluid. It happens um, easily and we, in that we facilitate the dialogue between women, elders, and the youth, because social data, social and cultural data are abundant actually. And yeah, I guess, and I think women are in possession of this abundant cultural data, to be honest, but that's just my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> Terima kasih, banyak, uh, Danik. Um, Lydia, can I come to you next? You know, uh, Danik talked about how they're doing to try and ensure that right the collection is you know reflecting cultural values but what about in terms of practicalities of just you know trying to take back that land related data uh, can this be done if so how yeah i find a lot of inspiration that looking at um, the scores of indigenous communities and indigenous scholars who are really working to both reclaim their data um, of their communities and also make sure policies in the future really assert their rights to have access to that, to have governance authority over that types of data. Um, and I, I think it's really important that we contextualize that a lot of um, data and, and material culture that about Indigenous peoples and our sacred ecosystems has been collected through very um, colonial expedition processes. And so there's both in the museum center of going back and reclaiming ancestors that are housed in museums, but then also going through and retroactively looking at databases that are collecting information about indigenous people's lands and ecosystems. So I work with the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance at the University of Arizona. And I think what's really powerful about this collaboratory is we have indigenous scholars from a variety of different disciplines. We've had Bruto come in and talk actually, um, talk to our group before, and really look at how people in a variety of different disciplines are thinking about how do we embed indigenous governance and indigenous rights into data infrastructures, into policies, um, and, and utilize this to support indigenous sovereignty in every capacity. And so I, I think it's those types of partnerships and recognizing them that they translate across political boundaries that are often not boundaries we assign or not boundaries that ecosystems assign to really ensure that we can support one another and learn from one another's examples and develop technologies and in data infrastructures that really assign rights embedded within them. And so you see some great examples happening here in the United States right now, the University of Maine has um, an eDNA program, right? So any environmental DNA samples that are being collected in the program itself, it will actually send a notification to the tribal nations that it was collected from and let their tribal historic preservation officer know about these programs or these projects happening. And so we need to really be thinking about as researchers, as community scholars, how do we start facilitating and building more programs like that um, and, and technologies like that to make sure that when we as an environmental scientist or a cultural anthropologist are collecting information about indigenous peoples, they are 
not just a collaborator, they are leading those pieces. They are knowing what's happening and telling us how good our data is. Because I think this is a really lost piece is that as, and this is partially how I was trained. We don't in, enough um, learn from the indigenous peoples whose lands we're working on and with. And I think we actually, it's, it really hinders our scientific process because we know indigenous knowledges have gone through the ultimate peer review process of being tested across millennia of generations. Um, but that is often really lost in our today's contemporary peer review process. It's only three people who are trained to think the same way. And so I think making sure that we can embed this into the practices, into the data infrastructures is a really vital piece of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. That's really interesting, particularly, you know, the examples that you gave. But also, can I just reiterate, I've been requested by the interpreters to try and slow down the speed of our, our speech. I know, you know, whenever I get excited and, uh, uh, you know, really into the topic that I'm talking about, I tend to speak faster and faster. So I guess just to take a deep breath and slow it down again so the interpreters can 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 follow everything that we're saying. Um, Rudo, I'm coming back to you. And my question is actually, you know, because you talked about the challenges um, and I was going to ask you about what can be done to include indigenous women in the data cycle, you know, in a way that's respectful. But there have been, there are quite a few questions that are already coming, um, addressing to you. So I also want to throw a couple of them to you in case you are also able to address them in your answer. And essentially, you know, you talked about the, the, the lack of autonomy um, the first time when I was asking you to set the scene. So if you can perhaps, you know, they're asking, can you expand on the a point you made about not having autonomy, Rudo, and the challenges also on the land data connection, uh, collection in areas dominated by Indigenous communities? What is the role of the woman in those particular issues. So I'm sorry asking you to condense three questions in one, but I'll give you an extra minute or two more to answer that. So, you know, perhaps again, you might still need to set the scene a little bit more and then talk about what can be done to include women in the data cycle. All yep, yours. We'll do. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so maybe first just starting with a quick reflection on what we mean by a data cycle, <laughs> right? When we talk about indigenous communities, and I think there's a lot of alignment here also with what Denik and Lydia just said. And I think if you, you know, disentangle data from any modern constructs and take data to just mean knowledge, then you'll find that communities have always had their data cycles about their land, right? For example, in the form of oral histories or through practical teachings on harvesting and planting, or, you know, the example from Bali that Denik brought out. So spatial knowledge that's inscribed onto palm leaves. And at least for all of the indigenous communities that I've had the fortune of working with, women have always had a strong role in those data cycles. So first, just to mention that to maybe set the stage a little bit. Um, but right, so as Denik pointed out, you know, the problem arises when those indigenous data cycles are somehow invalidated by outside actors who come in with their own worldview and conception of data, uh, such as that of geospatial data shown on maps, which is why for indigenous communities, they found it really useful and powerful uh, to collect spatial data using some of the same tools. Uh, to be able to stake out a claim and defend customary and collective right to traditional lands. So, you know, in terms of how to include Indigenous women in some of these data cycles that may involve using something like digital tools for participatory mapping, I think there's a few things to consider. Um, one is that it's important to design the project in such a way that Indigenous women can be included in the data stewardship process at every step of the way, as I mentioned before, there's some incompleteness there. Um, a lot of the community mapping process tends to only be inclusive during the data collection phase. And that's where the question of autonomy and perhaps reduced autonomy gets comes into play. And some of that has to do with the technology, right? The fact that the technology only lends itself to that initial process of data collection, but that afterwards there is um, a lack of access to that level of data and therefore a reduction in the overall autonomy over the ownership of that data, at least for remote communities. So to answer that question that came in there. Um, and right, and so once it progresses to this kind of analysis or decision making phase, there's much less representation. And the perspective of women in particular tends to be muted out by more dominant voices in that process. So, in terms of project design, being able to find a way that Indigenous women can be included throughout the entire process is, I think, really key. But it's worth pointing out that even during the data collection phase, it can be a challenge, frankly, to achieve the full participation. Um, often, women in Indigenous communities and other local communities as well carry a higher level of responsibility for domestic or agricultural work, 
And so when mapping trainings or workshops are organized, they're not always able to come or only able to come a few times. And at a certain point, it tends to be either the younger people or the men that take over that process, which and then ends up leads to this unequal transmission of knowledge, right? So even though the project design was intended to be kind of more democratic and inclusive, in practice, it doesn't always play out that way, right? So it's important to ensure that any planned activities are grounded in these practical realities of daily life in the community. And if you are in implementing a participatory mapping project, to think about maybe extra investments to be made so that to ensure that women can participate in these activities in an equal manner. Um, maybe just one final observation is just to be careful about what kind of data is understood to matter when it comes to land in particular. We're talking about land data today. And what I'd say here is that although different members of a community, they may possess different kinds of knowledge based on their lived experience. When it comes to land data, it's often the knowledge of men that ends up being privileged for a variety of different reasons, right? Some of that just has to do with patriarchy. Some of that is maybe because men have had more of an opportunity to travel through the land because of their, essentially their, their profession as maybe as hunters, for example, or as resource gatherers. And so male knowledge, there's a tendency for that to be privileged but women may also have a different and complementary form of knowledge about the land, which is often just as key for thinking about decisions around land management or land use planning. So when designing this kind of participatory mapping methodology, it's really important to make sure that the perspectives of women and really also that of youths and elders and the entire you know, corpus of the community is just as well represented. And sometimes that takes an extra effort in thinking um, about the project design. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Ruda, for being able to <laughs> um, put all of that, condense all of that uh, uh, in, a, in in your short answer and all the different questions as well. I have a second round of questions, but I also see that there are other questions coming in through the Q and A as well. And Danique, um, I actually want to go to you next because there's a question from the audience. Um, members asking about your opening statement. Um, the question said that you mentioned that data collection in indigenous communities, at least in, I think in Bali that you were mentioning, they're done by women with some level of ability. What kind of ability, and I'm assuming capacity, um, are you referring to? Can you explain a little bit more? Um, I guess I guess the, the the person is asking if you know you need to have some level of qualifications or some knowledge or certain I don't know tech, tech, uh, access to technology or, or or whatever abilities that they need to have um, in order to do the data collection. Um, can you explain a little bit more, Danik? Terima uh, kasih. Tadi yang saya maksudkan bahwa. Thank you. What I meant is that. In, based on our experience uh, in data collection, the ability that I was talking about is women. Uh, they're, they're more sophisticated in communication, in, in digging data. So uh, this is where the, the important role for women, between women and men. So the collection of data is done more by women and after the collection of data, we also train them to uh, process this data from spatial, uh, the, the use of data, and how to put this in, in written, how to, to, to put the in written social data after we process it. Usually, we invite academics uh as lydia mentioned we we invite academics to to analyze the data that has been collected uh, the special data by may that be uh, the social uh, cultural data so it's not just the perspective of us uh, indigenous people but the academic perspective the view from this analysis we will sit together, all members of the community. That's where we will then uh, uh, manage our 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 uh, spatial area. 
So there are several villages uh, whose uh, cultural and, and customary uh, is still very strong. So they build their own strategic uh, development. So this is, this is the, the involvement of youth, women, and the elderly of um, the village, because in Bali, even though the system is patriarchy, the patriarchy system, but the role of women is much, very much needed in 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 development planning, development planning. So they will be involved in all. Uh, in the rights to develop or in in um, the mapping uh, of data and the women exist women women is there so youth uh, mid level or elderly they're involved in in these processes after the process in the data collection in in the planning as uh, us, we as we assist them to to push this to towards the government uh, policy, but uh, more often this this action fail because the government has its own uh, spatial uh, um, management. So this is what needs to be synchronized in the space uh, management in within the government. We have done this several times to push for uh, indigenous village spatial um, development towards uh, to be included by the government. But, and all this process, even though, even though they still uh, are below ideal, but this uh, the involvement of women are really needed. And this is what we meant by by what we need the capacity. As long as they need and they can put aside their time for these processes. So mm -hmm. there's a question about how women can access this now, mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. in Indonesia. There is what we call SID or Village Information System. So they can access this within the village level. If it's a customary village, can be can be can be accessed there too. So not all, not all women want to be involved, but uh, or access data. So they need to be represented. That they say that they need this data or that data. So it's not about how. It's not about. Uh, the limitation or they being limited, but it, actually it's the limitation within their own uh, customary to access data. This is where we come in. So how we can help them to access data, to use data, the mapping, um, that's th those are our uh, tasks on the field to help uh, these community to how they can use and collect and use and and they can benefit from from the data and the mapping now uh, and and we as i said earlier our ancestor has uh inscriptions but now the youth i, I don't use that they, they 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 are a digital uh community so so we try to make these adjustments that is currently uh, being used in, in Indonesia, which is a one map uh, system. That's what we have done so far. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you so much, Danique. Sorry to, to, to interrupt. I believe Betty has joined us from the field. Um, is that correct? Can I? Um, can I get confirmation if Betty has joined us? If if so, um, would like uh, to hear from Betty. Betty, are you there with us? Hello? 
okay, maybe not. <laughs> Let me go back to regular scheduling um, in that case while we try and see if Betty is still able to, to join us in the, in the last few minutes. Um, Lydia, uh, just very quickly, there's another question as well in terms of getting more youth involved um, in, you know, in terms of data collection, but also just, you know, maintaining and, 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 and I guess land tenure rights for Indigenous peoples? Is there a strategy to have more people involved? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, intergenerational um, involvement in land data, land based data is really vital to this work. So we definitely are losing our knowledge holders and experts at alarming rates. But making sure that we have more educational programming about teaching um, youth about cultural sites, about the, how we refer to plants, animals, our non-human kins, all of that is really vital. But I also think that youth play a really significant role because they've always existed with these data ecosystems, these very rich data environments that we have today. So their vital role is really how do we build technologies and infrastructures that support the needs and priorities of our communities, as well as survive within these digital environments. And I think that's the power of, of education. That's why I'm in a researcher and a professor or a teacher is because of those pieces, but also um, it goes that it's an intergenerational piece where we need elders there to be able to tell us the pieces about the ecosystem that we don't know or help us understand what was what was once there to envision what's possible. Um, and so I think that those go hand in hand and far too often, both of those sides of the spectrum, the elders and the youth are often left out of these conversations, but I think that they play the most important roles. Thank you. Thanks for that, Lydia. Okay, we're gonna try again um, because Betty apparently is online. She's just having issues with her audio. So Betty, can we can we check if you if you are around? Like I said, you know, Betty is a, 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 a she was she's a Kichwa leader. She was the president of Puerto Rica community before, and then she is now the first woman president of the Federation of Native Communities um, in the region of Loreto in Peru. And you know, Betty's uh, uh, known for being a very tech savvy environmental defender. And, you know, that's why we're having trouble connecting to her today because she is out in the field doing the difficult work. Um, Betty, can you hear us? And are you there? Um, Thin, I think Betty would need some translation, but she hasn't worked out uh, how to do the translation. So okay. uh, if uh, one of the Spanish translators can just join and translate to Betty to figure that out for her. Thanks. Uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, yes, can we can we receive help from uh, a, a Spanish translator, perhaps even on the English channel that Betty is possibly in to to see um, if you can translate to her how to select the Spanish channel. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Betty, where does Axel like to help oh. if you speak Spanish? Albert. That would be great, just very briefly. Yes, thank you, Diana. Can you just repeat what you would like me to ask her? I'm sorry, then. Oh, just tell her how to access the translation button sure. on her Zoom so that she can then hear us and be able to speak. Okay, and that's the question is for, uh, the information is for? Betty, for yes. Betty, yes. Betty, hola, soy Diana, estoy aquí apoyando, ¿me entiende? Hi, Betty, I'm Diana, can you hear me? Betty, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Diana. Betty, can you select at the bottom of your screen, there is a globe that says interpretation. If you touch, if you press on that globe, you can choose the um, language you wish to hear. If you want to listen to Spanish, we will have interpretation in Spanish. You, you can listen in English, etc. Can you find it, Betty? Can you find the interpretation button? Yes, yes, yes. I'm in the Spanish channel. Are you in the Spanish channel? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, Betty's in the Spanish channel. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Diana, for all of that help and everybody else behind the scenes is making sure that this works. Betty, very, very welcome to you, even though you're joining us in the last 15 minutes. Um, we wanted to give you a chance to speak. We've been talking about, you know, how to get Indigenous women involved in data collection and use and, and, and empower them. You know, um, it would be great to hear some of your experiences in terms of some of the challenges for Indigenous women and what are some what are the things that can be done to improve the situation? Okay. Um, buenos días a todos. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry about being late, but it was because of the signal. What I do would like to say is that Indigenous women, honestly, they have gone through it is very difficult for indigenous women to have higher roles or access to certain things we do not we are not free to represent other people or other women in public spaces so that's a great challenge however i believe that if we promote women being trained and to have greater opportunities to go out and see other experiences, to share experiences with other women who are doing more things, it would be a great challenge. It would be a great help. So women can have access to those spaces, which is already difficult. But yes, we do need somebody or maybe we, we will need some events more meetings where we can invite more women that can participate and therefore will have a great a greater opportunity to strengthen some skills in different spaces from our community from our local spaces and if it, if it if there's a possibility to have virtual meetings like we are having at the moment that would be a great achievement for women to, for other women to also are in the front line. Thank you very much, uh, Basi, muchas gracias. Um, so glad to have you. Um, and thank you so much for joining despite, you know, being in the field and having issues with Signal. Um, we don't have that much time and we still have a couple more questions and we want particularly, we want to make sure that we answer questions from the participants. Um, and there's a, a question, um, let me read it out. <clears throat> it says, you know, right now, because the participatory and inclusive process is inculcated in community processes such as data gathering, how does this help women in securing their land rights, particularly in cases where they're not allowed to own or even have rights over lands. Um, do we have a practical example of how you know these this process can help women? Um, what Lydia, I was wondering whether there's you know uh, we speak briefly and you say you don't necessarily have an example, but you you know you can talk about uh, the general uh, uh, um, issues around it. So it would be great to hear from you and you know Danik. Uh, Rudo, Betty, if you want to answer this question as well after Lydia, I'll come to you. Thank you. Yeah, I just think that it's a really vital question since today our conversation is around um, women and land rights. And I think making sure that we're really clear about identifying some of the factors of this so that violence against the land and violence against women are interrelated. Um, we see that in man camps and up here, we see that with domestic violence issues. So this violence happening externally and internally within communities is a really important piece. Um, but I also see empowerment that I feel like it's these collectives of indigenous women landholders that are happening. You see some great examples um, in the Bay Area of, of women led land trust um, and land, buying back land as a collective that are really empowering pieces. Um, but in, in specifically in regards to these places where women don't have land rights, how do we get above that? And that's where I think that some of these economic factors um, and organizations that are wanting to support land back movements, uh, really putting their funds towards indigenous women led initiatives. And I, and I do think we often talk about the spectrum of indigenous, but I think indigenous women led are, are really important pieces because we're often the communities that are the most marginalized in land discussions. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, I just wanted to, I, I have a couple more questions, but I wanted to ask if anybody else wants to jump in. Yes, Betty. I do yes. like to add something. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, in that case, I think it is important for women to participate. As I, uh, as I said before, there are organizations that are promoting women's participation, and that is important. It's important also to strengthen that for other women to participate and to be able to gain the to gain land rights. Of course, women are very vulnerable. Uh, and however, the important thing is that in indigenous communities, women are the core thing because women are um, on the top of everything that is happening in the community and what we're leaving behind for our future generations. So there are discussions that can strengthen these organizations based in waste uh, or women-led organizations that is important so we can give more opportunities for women to assume those roles and to have those spaces available for them. Great, thank you so much. Um, Bruto, could I just ask if um, you have any specific examples that you might be willing to, to share, if you, if you remember any, you know, because the question was asking whether there are any practical examples. So. Yeah, I think so. Uh, just briefly, I can frame yeah. this question just in terms of, you know, mapping for land rights and tenure, which is also what we focus on at Cadasta. And, you know, I think there's sometimes a tension between, on the one hand, introducing a participatory mapping project um, that allows communities to map the things that are important to them and to really focus on those cultural values that were mentioned earlier. But on the other hand, also the requirements for formal land demarcation, which sometimes may feel like an outside imposition, something that comes from the state apparatus rather than something that's reflecting the community's internal perspective on their land, um, which is, I think, kind of related to this question. And, you know, the two goals are not opposed. And there's some great methodologies that I'm thinking of from South America in particular that kind of speak to this, like the plan de vida approach, uh, which starts by asking broad questions about what the territory used to look like, um, what it looks like today, and what we want it to look like. And these kinds of broad framing questions enable different community members to speak to those different kinds of things. So when you're thinking about what the territory used to look like, you're um, not just thinking about elders, but especially elders have a lot to, to offer in that perspective. Then when you get to questions like what it looks like today, that's where you start to have uh, different members of the community, like for also women, being able to contribute on the nature of land management and what the community and the territory looks like. And then when you're thinking about what we want it to look like, that's almost a question that's targeting the youth, right? And the, the coming generations and the territory that we want to leave behind for the coming generations. So I think it's a really good example of an approach that can really frame the questions around land management and even thinking about land rights, um, because asking these kinds of questions ensures that the discussion stays focused on that indigenous point of view of the territory and it captures all of the voices, including women, but then it also yields concrete plans of action, right, about which parts of the land the community wants to map, um, protect and hold collectively. So it's a way of getting at land tenure and land rights while still making sure that um, you're answering those questions from an indigenous point of view and getting all of the input from all of the different members of the community, um, including women. Great, thanks, Ruder. We are actually running out of time, but there's quite a few more questions and I want to take as many as possible. So I'm going to throw, you know, three, <clears throat> um, you know, questions um, and I will just let any of the speakers just take them whichever one they want. Um, so three questions and, and I think they're quite interesting one. One is can somebody give an example of how community gathered data can be used and what would women bring to, to, to that process exactly? That's number one. Number two, um, what are some of the risks associated with data collection by Indigenous women? I think that's interesting. Are there, are there any risks, particularly, I guess, in, you know, communities where women, you know, are not allowed to own land or whether they're very conservative? Are there, are there risks associated if Indigenous women collect data? Um, and, and, and the third one is, you know, um, inclusion. You know, how do we deal with this uh, um, feelings where in some communities, perhaps women feel 
that things like land registration process and data collection and data usage is a man's role. How do we overcome that? So three interesting questions that I'm throwing at you in the last four or five minutes of the session. Um, example of how community gather data can be used and, and, and specifically what women would bring. Um, second, risk associated with data collection by Indigenous women and inclusion. How do we overcome perhaps the feeling that perhaps this is the role for men? Um, Betty, I want to come to you first. Feel free to take any of these questions or, or, or you know, just one or if you can condense all the answers in, in one go, that would also be great. And then Danik, I'll come to you after Betty and then Lydia and Ruder, if, if that's okay. Uh, Betty, would you like to go first? Yes. How to deal with um, this information? Well, women in my territory, we are doing monitoring in the indigenous communities. In all the communal area that we are surrounded by, we have communal assemblies according to the, the information that we collect from the forest. So through those assemblies, we discuss and we make decisions about what is going to happen with our territory, what is happening at the moment with our territory. That's what we do in the communal assemblies. And we do some decision making so the community can manage according to the problems that we run into in the territories. When it comes to gender equality, women are not being given the chance to go into the territory, but it is important for, for us, for women, to do the work so we can show our children that they have to know in depth their territory, what is happening within it. And another thing is that the conflicts and the risks that we run into in the work that we do certainly us as women have some hardships when we do this type of work. We are threatened because of the things that we have um, complaint, you know, environmental issues and illegal logging, uh, mining. So we, we as women are very concerned and that is a great risk that as women, and even myself, I had gone through that. I felt threatened to be a spokeswoman for the community from the community itself and I've been defending the territory of the indigenous communities, but I, that has never limited me. Uh, that has never. Uh, um, I, I could have. I can continue fighting and uh, raising my voice. In this case, the, we have to see the possibility for women to have uh, opportunities to strengthen our capacities. So other women can come by and continue the work that we do. Thank you, Betty. Um, Danik, um, your your final thoughts before we wrap up to those questions? Thank you, Lynn, for the time. Let me just add, maybe a little different in Bali, because we in Bali, it's a small community, it's not very big, so we're so all the space in Bali uh, has been in the uh, uh, indigenous village, how the right between men and women, if they're married, so that's uh, become, uh, uh, it's unified. So what becomes the right of a man becomes the right of the wife. So the access to land is, is, is something uh, is unified. So. The Balinese don't just look at land in 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 in, in individual way, but all has been governed. Um, so, to to us in Bali, this has been determined, and sometimes, be, because of this, there is there is a infrastructure development the need. We understand with that need, with the investment that come that that comes in that flow in. Um, 
but there's also a question what are the risks to women for women if they're not involved in these processes for us in bali maybe the risk maybe there's little minimum risk, uh, risk. we don't feel that yet but in general this is if the women are not active this will in itself close the access but the, the, the space is always open for women to be involved but so yeah so th this is very little risk here because we don't have mining here but in in in, in the household itself yes there might be a little disruption if if the women is not involved or not being involved in these processes uh so thank that's you. what's happening in our household here in bali okay thank you Janik. Terima kasih banyak. Um, Lydia? Yeah, I think I'll just answer the question about what are the risks associated with data collection by Indigenous women. And I think I would just summarize that. I think it's recognizing the risks of being an Indigenous woman and going out into the world and that there are risks that are always going to be associated with that. I've been field collect, um, out field sampling and got harassed and um, propositioned for um, things that made me really uncomfortable while I was out been out field sampling in California, you know, so I think it's recognizing that these risks exist everywhere. Um, and that a lot of a lot of these are environments that weren't designed for women or for indigenous peoples. So I think recognizing that those can be compounded um, risks associated in these spaces. And then when you go into places that also have more political contention, um, that those risks just get amplified. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Rudar. Yeah, I'll just quickly um, add to also the risks question. That's where my mind went to as well. Um, and I think a lot about, you know, data extractivism in general when it comes to Indigenous communities. Of course, historically, there's been a lot of that, which Lydia spoke to. And that's why the Indigenous data sovereignty movement is so important, you know, when thinking about technology and methodologies and ensuring that communities are in the driver's seat at all times when it comes to their data and have full decision making power over who has access and who doesn't. And I think the same thing applies to that of Indigenous women when it comes to their data. There's perhaps a greater risk um, insofar as potentially Indigenous women may not be involved in those final decision-making process of what gets to be done with the data. So even internally, there could be a risk of extractivism where you know Indigenous women's data is used somehow um, for making certain decisions about the land, but they're not involved in those processes, right? So even I think internally, there's potentially some risks about that. And I think the best way to really mitigate that is just to enable communities to create their own data methodologies and solutions as much as possible and to not rely on kind of outside approaches or tools. Those can be useful, but they're often not really serving communities in the ways that they want to and demand to. So I think that's one way of mitigating that, um, but the risks still remain, of course. Great, thank you. Thank you for, for, for not only talking about the risks, but also how to mitigate them. That's really helpful. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. We're four minutes over. We did start a couple of minutes late. So I guess, you know, we're, we're forgiven, but we do need to end the event right now. So, you know, I would just like to say thank you so much to all of our speakers who joined from all corners of the world, despite bad connections, different time zones and everything. Um, can we give them a virtual round of applause, please, for all of their insights and to helping us understand this whole issue around data better. And of course, thank you to the audience as well for your participation. We would also like to thank our hosts at the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility and the Thomson Reuters Foundation. It's been a real pleasure for me to moderate this event. Apologies for all the questions that we weren't able to take, but we hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation around data and indig Indigenous women, and that you will hopefully continue this conversation in other avenues as well. So have a great day, afternoon and evening or night. Goodbye. Thank you.